have you ever been in uh, a small store, a small establishment of one sort or another, and you see a display like this where it says, how many beads in the jar, answer inside, fill out your, your guess and put it in the box, and, and there's a, a little number of, of pre-printed slips asking for your name, address, and, and telephone number. Should you be the winner, they need to notify you. And if you're not the winner, they need to call you about buying a spa, or, 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 or aluminum siding, or driveway sealant, or something like that. I have found, in my experience, that some people have the uncanny ability to, to guess very precisely how many items there are. Perhaps they have that spatial uh, ability. Um, Mama says, I'm spatial. <laughs> I told you it got worse. Uh, there may be one or two of you in this audience who have that ability, but I know for a fact if we could somehow pool all of our knowledge together in that uh, Jungian super consciousness that you hear about, I'm sure as a group we'll be far more successful than we will be as individuals. Therefore, I require a show of hands. Uh, obviously there are more than a hundred, so I won't even ask below a hundred. But by your show of hands, how many feel there are between 100 and 200 beads in the jar? Show of hands. Mm -hmm. How many believe between 200 and 300? Show of hands. Far more. How many between uh, 300 and 400? One, two, and how many just don't care? All oh, one. Oh, very good. Okay. So the consensus would be between 200 and 300. Now, if we, you are limited only to that range between 200 and 300 beads in this jar, how many believe there are between 200 and 250? Show of hands. Fair number. How many between 250 and 300? Uh, how many between 2 and 250 again? I think you have it. It's between 200 and 250. In that case, all that remains is to have the choice narrowed down one more time. This gentleman sitting here in the somewhat uh, skeptical position. Your name, sir? Larry. Larry? If you are limited to the choice between 200 and 250, how many beads are in this jar? There's 226. Two Really? That's scary. That's scary. Uh, step up here, please, if you don't mind. And give the gentleman a hand. All right. Uh, turn and face the audience. Your name was Larry? Larry. Scary Larry. Scary. All right. You enjoying the uh, presentation yes, so I far? Am. We'll fix that. Now, <laughs> Larry, there are um, a, a number of ways that we could confirm how many beads are in this jar. And I, here, would you just hold out your hand here? There you go. For example, I have a number of alternatives right here. How many beads are in this jar? You can figure out quite easily if you happen to be slightly mathematically inclined. J is the jar weight, B is the bead weight, W is the weight of the bead filled jar. The formula for the number of beads is W minus J, the quantity divided by B. That's one way. If you are even more mathematically inclined, there's a better way. If you are Spatial. D is the diameter of the jar, H is the height of the jar, R is the radius of the bead. The formula for the number of beads is pi times the quantity D divided by 2 squared times H, the quantity divided by 4 thirds pi times R cubed. Really? There's a better way. Look, you can actually open the jar and count the beads. True. Well, it'd take a little while. I, I get paid by the minute, but there's a better way. You can ask the fellow, the person who filled the jar. That was me. You're perfectly correct. I mean, you're right on. But, oh, ye of little faith. You see, I knew there would be questioning stares from the audience. That's why I brought this. Hold. You see, because when I packed the jar, on the inside, I wrote how many there were on my business card. And there it is right there. You said there were 226. Would you please read what I wrote out loud? Read it. There are exactly 226 beads. You're very good. Yeah. Give this man a hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. I'm gaining on you. <laughs> OK. This is a delightful piece. Let me tell you a little something about this. This, I think, does more than anything else 
to illustrate once again the difference between how a contemporary mentalist thinks and how magicians and mentalists up until the current date think. Okay? And here, I'll put you to work if you don't mind. Just uh, beads back in the jar. You see, if I were a Joe Dunninger and used the approach, and of course, Joe Dunninger is the only model that we really have in our craft as a superbly successful mentalist. Well, I mean, there's Kreskin, but he's doing Dunninger's act. So, I mean, um, is reputed to be doing uh, a Dunninger's act. Um, well, actually, he's pretty much carved out his own niche now. Um, Uri Geller, I suppose, but there are a lot of people who kind of push. So really, our only example is Dunninger. The way Dunninger would have done that is like this. Sir, we've never met before, is that correct? This is correct. You appear to be rather pleased with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but wait, you also appear to be, sir, a person of uh, not uh, immodest means, uh, uh, but you have some change in your pocket, I should think, yes? Do you have any idea how much change might be in your pocket? No. no. If you would, I mean, don't do it now, but he'd say, if you would reach into your pocket and count your change, I shall make a prediction. How much money do you have, sir? He says $2.26. Aha, exactly what I wrote, $2.26. The problem with that type of approach these days, I saw an old Dunninger kinescope. That's when they didn't have videotape, but they made like movies off of television and they were awful. I saw a kinescope of Dunninger performing. By today's standards, he was a real snoozer. Today's audiences wouldn't have sat still for that. Today's audiences won't sit still for a performer placing himself on this pedestal. I have a super mind. You don't. You may applaud now. I mean, come on. That just, that can't happen. Everything else has changed since, I mean, Dunninger performed in the 40s and the 50s. He died in the 60s. Movies have changed. Cars have changed. Television has changed. Audiences have changed. We need to change our approach as well. But those of you who recognized the, uh, uh, the analogy I do to Dunninger will now know the methodology behind this presentation. It is our old friend, the Swami gimmick, or the thumb writer. It's a little band that clips onto your thumb and you write with it, okay? Now, it happens again, because I'm a mentalist, it happens on the offbeat when you're not ready for it, okay? But what you do is this. You take one of your business cards, and you write on it, there are, oh, using, uh, I use a Listo lead. It's this uh, black uh, China marking pencil, kind of like a crayon. The reason for that is that it's nice and broad, kind of like a felt tip pen, but there are no felt tip pen thumb writers of which I'm aware. But I want a nice, broad, easily read stroke. Because if I get a person up from the audience, either I will always pick someone wearing glasses why? Because you know he is equipped with correction for his poor vision. If I choose someone who's not wearing glasses, I don't know whether he has 20-20 vision or simply left his glasses at home and won't be able to read what I've written. So therefore, it, it's nice and large in computer terms. This would be about 18-point type and, and with a nice dark pencil uh, uh, or uh, grease pencil on a white card. And you write, there are exactly, leave a blank space, beads. <laughs> I mean, you don't need to write the rest of this. It's torturous enough writing three digits with, with the thumb gimmick, okay? Now, also, when you write, be sure that you hold it in your hand and, and, and don't make all the letters the same and don't make it pretty because your digits won't be. And, and you want to make sure it kind of matches, all right? You write, there are exactly blank beads. Then you fold this in half. And then you unfold it about an eighth of an inch from the original fold making a little Z fold, okay, like that. Do you see that? Okay, it's a little Z fold. That will come in handy in a second because this allows you both to fill in the information when you need to and also to make sure that the card shows up where it should. And here is the second half of the presentation. You need one of these. I specifically left the label on. So you could see what to go and buy. Go into your local Sam's Club uh, a warehouse, uh, a grocery store, or any other place where you can, restaurant supply store, and get yourself the 60-ounce jar of Miracle Whip. And then you'll want to take the labels off. Okay, don't get a smaller jar. I'll tell you why in a second.
The next thing you must do, oh, make sure it's a plastic jar, because you're going to cut a slot in the jar. This jar has a slot in it. It's not a slit, it's a slot. There's a difference. It's right here. Okay. It's right there. Okay, it goes from there to there. It is cut right along the, the, the seams where the two halves of, of the jar have been uh, 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 welded or glued or whatever together. Okay? So it's almost invisible. Now when I say a slot, I mean it. Here's how you cut it. You get yourself a straight edge, like a, like a, a metal a ruler. And you tape above and below so it stays put. Get yourself an X-Acto knife. It's one of those, the shape of a pen with a sharp little pointed blade on the end. But what you don't do is you don't cut with the sharp side of the blade. You cut with the dull side of the blade. Sounds counterintuitive, but there's a reason for it. You see, when you drag the dull point of the blade across the plastic, it shaves away one little curly cue of plastic and kind of etches just a little bit into the jar. Then you do it again and again and again and again until you have etched away a slot exactly one exacto blade wide. The reason for that should now become apparent. You see, if this were the surface of the jar, if you were to cut through the jar, what would happen first is the plastic would bend inward, creating a curve which would pick up specular highlights, reflections, and make it look a lot larger than it really is. The second thing that would happen is, while it would, would stay a little curved, it would also spring back into position. It would effectively close that slit and you couldn't easily put the card through, which is what's going to have to happen in a second. Therefore the slot. Now don't don't cut a double wide. Don't, don't cut two slits and then and trim out in between them. That's too large. Then you wouldn't feel comfortable placing it in someone's hands, which of course is what I did. Okay? And, and that's another uh, it's like if you have a stack deck and, and you place it on the deck over in front of someone while you go through, the implication is, well, he could have picked it up, he could have looked at it, he could have gone through it, and therefore he didn't. Okay. Same thing. Put it on his hand. Uh, I, ask him to, I ask him to hold out his hand and I put it there. I don't say, here, take the jar, because then he might grab the jar and squeeze, and, oh, hello there, okay, place it on his hand. All right. Now when it comes time to prepare for this, there are exactly blank beads. The card goes into the slit like that and then bends over. You see what we have here? Half of the card lies underneath the plastic. The Z fold comes up through the slot and the rest of it lays on the outside of the jar. In perfect position then for you to do your thumb writing with your gimmick. What did I do with it? Here it is right here. Okay. Now. You also, therefore, have a fairly large jar. This is important. Remember I said don't get a small jar? The reason is, first of all, you need justification to be, be able to hold the jar in two hands because you have to write with one of them. Now, there may be some sadists or perfectionists out there who want to write with one hand while holding the jar just in one hand. I am not one of them. I have better things to do with my time than to rehearse a focaccia little technique like this. So instead, I hold it in two. But imagine if I'd wimped out and gotten the 40 ounce jar size. Then I'm standing here holding it like this. Looks a little strange, doesn't it? Okay. It, 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 again, your audience isn't going to say, oh, he's holding a 40 ounce jar strangely. Must be using a swami gimmick behind it. <laughs> but they will say to themselves, something's not right here. Something's just not quite right. And you don't want that occurring with your audience. So get the larger jar. Then, when it comes time to write, when you first narrow it down, say between 200 and 300, then go ahead and write the first two. Right there, you've got all the time in the world, write your first two. Then, and how many between 200 and 250, and he said 226, and you've already written the, the, the next two, and really six? Come on up here, and as he do, does, you write the other six. Okay, and he's coming on up, and this just goes in your pocket. And you, oh, you don't have to get rid of it, but I am going to shake his hand, and that would feel real funny. <laughs> so, I do ditch this. Oh, by the way, you'll want several of these little Swami gimmicks, because you will lose them. Okay, sometimes the lead will break off right in the middle of the two. So you need to know where to go get another one, and I have more of them back here ready to go. Anyway, as he's coming up, all I do is this. I just fold the card over and look, it's already sticking through the slot, so it just slides very easily. 
just inside the jar like that. It goes all the way in. I run my fingernail down the slot. If I want to, I can smack it like that to reset it. If you're real guilty, which I'm not, but if you're real guilty about the card being right there next to the, the slot, and if you think some, he, he may, you know, while you're turned around, look at that and then look at that, which he won't, but if you're real guilty about it, you can give the jar a, a spin like that to move it away from the slot. All right. Then all that's necessary is to restate the number because there has been a certain amount of time gone by from when he said 226 until this is revealed. So be sure you restate the number as you're pouring out the beads. Oh, it is impossible to find a round aquarium net. They don't sell round aquarium nets because you can't get the fish in the corners. <laughs> they come square, so I just took a square net and bent it round and then took the big old long handle and cut it and bent it. And you need to, and, and, and I was tempted to put in a zipper and a little handle that, that did this, but uh, that would, would have been regression, wouldn't it? Anyway, I, uh, uh, you need some place to catch the beads, and this was as elegant as I could think of. Um, one additional thing, and that is, um, whenever I lecture, never for lay audiences, but whenever I'm lecturing, the person who, who reads the card always feels compelled to show it to the audience. Okay? I've never had a lay person do that. Because a lay person says, yeah, there are 226 beads. That's what it says right here, and the audience will believe him. But we magicians are so used to people not trusting us that we always show them when we're doing the right thing. Okay, <laughs> and, and so therefore, uh, natural habit took over. And yeah, see, I'm not cheating. I don't know. I really, really did write it down. Yes, it's there. Okay, but don't expect your, your lay person to show it to the audience. And in truth, it's not necessary. Just ask him to read word for word what's written on the card, please. There are exactly 226 beads. Okay, this, uh, are there any questions, sir? Once you've written the number, how do you get the card in the jar? I'll show you. I'll remember, the card starts off already in the slit with half of the card inside the jar and half of it on the outside like this. Then as he's coming up and crossing in front of me, all I need to do is this. I just fold the card over like that and push with my fingers. And it goes right through the slit and inside, okay? And then that if you need to. Any other questions? Good, this delightful piece was, uh, was uh, written up or, or presented to Syzygy, contributed to Syzygy by Jack Dean. He's known as the Dean of American Mentalists. Uh, you'll find his ads in the Linking Ring and, and some of the other magazines because he does do business by mail order. Uh, but this was the one piece which received the highest number of, uh, of votes for uh, Syzygy's Best, and it's called Guessin' Gumballs, and I hope you liked it. Yeah. Um, one more thing. This is so versatile. You can use it, for example, if you were doing a, uh, a trade show for a pharmaceutical manufacturer, you could use pills in here. If you're doing an agribusiness convention, you could use peanuts or kernels of corn. Or for a hardware convention, you could use nuts and bolts. Now, as I'm telling you that, I see one or two little glimmers saying, yeah, yeah, and I could put like pieces of hard candy in there and do it for kid shows. Don't you do this for a kid show. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Mentalism requires an intelligent, aware audience. Children are not. <laughs> now, honestly, mentalism requires the ability to reason. And until a child reaches age nine or maybe even ten, depending, his brain isn't hardwired for reason. You can't reason with an eight-year-old. It can't be done. I mean, you do this for a bunch of kids, and they're going to say, yeah, 226, so I knew that. And every other kid says, yeah, I knew that, I knew that and you get nowhere. A mentalism is not for kids. If I hear, if I get word, if the grapevine tells me that one of you has, has taken this and you're out doing it for kids, I will buy a first class ticket on United Airlines. I will fly from Phoenix direct to Portland. I will come to where you are. I will open your door and I will slap you. <laughs> Adults only, please.